Hello BookTube. I have an original tag for you today on this Tag Tuesday. It was created by Brian at Bookish uh, and he tagged me. Uh, and it's a tag that I'm not 100% sure I can do on this channel or would even want to do if I could. <laughs> and you'll see why right away. It's the sex in literature tag. Uh, Brian just recently read his very first Regency romance and he decided to jump into the stormy end of the pond with a Lisa Kleypas novel. Uh, and Lisa Kleypas is one of the the handful of modern Regency writers who get pretty explicit in their in their sex scenes and that and a bunch of other videos that and thoughts that Brian has been having prompted this tag uh, so let's get straight to the questions and see if how far we can go before I create a tag the a video that I can't upload uh, question number one is what is the book that you have read that comes closest to crossing the line between literature and adult fiction or pornography uh, and right away the first question causes problems because uh, all depictions of the actual physical action of sex in literature are pornography. There is no line. So I could name a writer like Dennis Cooper, who I've mentioned on this channel before, has uh, many, many, many scenes of pornography in his writing, but I could also name lots of other people too. Lots of people who are in the English canon who might have written a canonical work of literature, but periodically in the course of that work of literature they descend into pornography. But there is no line, so, <laughs> and we're going to get to the reason why. The reason why, well, we, don't have, we don't have to beat around the bush, so to speak. The reason why people think there's a line is because people think that some amount of linguistic virtuosity can save this stuff, and it can't. Uh, so it's, it's a category thing, not a performance thing. Uh, question number two is, what is a book you have read with a cringe-worthy depiction or discussion of sex? Every single one. There has never been, in the entire course of literature as written by humans, a successful example. There are plenty of, of examples uh, that are cringeworthy and yet successful because their aim is not literary. Their aim is something else, and there are plenty of examples of that that work. But I don't think, in fact, I know for sure that's not what Brian's thinking about when he, write, when he comes up with this question. He's thinking about something literary. Literary. <laughs> And there is no example of that. All examples of that are cringeworthy. <laughs> uh, question number three is, what's the most overrated book with a reputation for being sexy that you have read? Well, one of the examples isn't the whole book, but it's the very chapter from Ulysses that Brian reads uh, with worship in his eyes. <laughs> but also every other canonical example named, you know, D.H. Lawrence and a million others. There, there is no way to salvage this. <laughs> there is no way to do this well. Any, any more than having a snuff killing in your novel can be done well or poorly. <laughs> it's, um, <laughs> the actual thing that we're talking about here suspends, by its very nature, not only the movement of the plot, but also the movement of the characters. You check your character at the door. There is no way to be an individual in in the moments that we're talking about. That's the whole point of them. That is their elementary appeal. <laughs> there, there's no way to describe it well, or I guess, there's no way to describe it usefully in literature because it cannot further the plot. It cannot deepen character. It cannot do anything literary. The only reason that it exists in so many books, the only reason authors feel like, oh, well, that's a gauntlet thrown down, I have to try my hand at it, is because we are a communal primate species with genitalia and mammary glands on the outside. <laughs> I assure you that if turtles wrote literature, they would not write porn. It would never even cross their mind. <laughs> That's the only reason people try. It's a species thing. It has nothing to do with a literary challenge because it can't be succeeded. You can't succeed at it. Uh, anyway, <laughs> anyway uh, all of them are overrated, is my point. They're all boring. Uh, question number four, what is your favorite passage from a book about or describing sex or sexual situation? 
as I've mentioned, there isn't one. They're all bad. They're all boring. They all make me tap my toe with impatience. The minute I realize that, a, that an author is trundling the machinery into view onto stage and is about to get ready at giving their attempt at I know you make terrible awards. You make awards for how, how bad this kind of writing can get. And I know, I know that in all the books that you've read, canonical and otherwise, when you get to that scene, you realize, oh, this is really bad. This is like watching your grandparents try to, to, to dance. But I'm going to be the one that does it. <laughs> Granted, nowhere in my reading history have I ever seen a successful example. I never had even imagined how one could be done, but you just hold on right there. I know you're interested in what happens to these characters and the decrepit mansion and the mad woman in the attic, but I'm going to put all that on hold while I trundle this machinery on stage. I'm going to pull these curtains here. I'm going to solve these lenses with Vaseline. You're going to love it. Trust me. No, it never works. Never. Never. All it ever does with me is make me want the writer to get over it and get back to the story. <laughs> uh, uh, question number five. What is a book you have recently read that you think handles descriptions or discussions of sex? Well, nothing in fiction. And I'm sure that fiction is what's meant here. I've read quite a bit of nonfiction that handles it really, really well. Peggy Ornstein's book, Boys and Sex, was terrific. Uh, there was a book a couple of years ago called Not Gay that was an examination through primary interviews and, and lots of uh, as much research as could be done with young men who sometimes or even often sleep with other young men but do not identify as gay. <laughs> and I, I thought it did a really good job, really good job. But fiction? No. <laughs> no. Uh, uh, question number six, a head scratcher, a definite head scratcher. What are some books that contain positive or frank depictions of sexual relations between LGBTQ plus characters? And uh, I'm just going to use the word gay for those. And, and Brian uh, suggests, and he echoes, he echoes a, couple, a couple of other videos, he suggests that frank and protracted depictions of gay sex are rare in literature. And I, I don't know what to say to that. I, I have no idea what to say to that. Gay authors have been writing this sort of stuff for 70 years in great oceans. <laughs> so it's great oceans, great gouts of this stuff. So I, I have no idea what to do with the underlying assumption, which is that we need more pornography, more gay pornography in literature. I don't think we need any pornography in literature, but much less... Uh, more gay pornography, but the, the underlying sort of assumption that there, that it's a rarity, I don't know what to do with that. It's not. It's not in any way a rarity. So uh, I think I think in this particular case it could be a reflection of the of the narrow reading that that Brian and maybe a couple of these other booktubers have done in that in that very trough <laughs> because the, the, there's lots there's lots out there. So I I don't know I don't know what to do with that. Uh, but I I hasten to add that it doesn't make any difference. It doesn't make any difference uh, <laughs> it doesn't make any difference which board game is being played. They're all dumb. It's all dumb. No one can do it right because it can't be done right. Because it has no place in a work of literature. And that's not a prude. That's not me being prudish. That's me saying what, what has places in a work of literature are the things that further the, the aim of literature. So it makes no more sense for characters who are scheming with each other or plotting with each other or secretly lusting after each other or wanting to betray each other. It makes no more sense to stop everything and spend three pages describing them groping with each other without ever thinking, without ever saying anything. It makes no more sense to do that than it would in the course of a novel about a surprise inheritance of a manor in England to suddenly digress for four or five pages about the the industry of stonemasonry in the early 18th century when the house was built. Any editor in the world would say, well, you know, it's, I guess, smoothly enough written, but take it out. Of course, take it out. It has no, it doesn't bear on the book in any way, so take it out. And every critic on BookTube that I ever watch who reviews a book of one kind or another will always, almost always get to a point in a book where they'll say, well, this part didn't further the book at all. I think the author should have just taken it out. Well, okay, that, I, I agree with that kind of thinking completely, and it's reflected here. There is no exemption for porn. <laughs> porn also doesn't advance 
the plot at all and should be taken out. So, so it's not like some things, yes, but this is, I guess, essentially human. It's what drives us. No, 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 take it out. Uh, and then question number seven is, uh, what do you think is the best way of depicting sex in literature and fiction with an ellipses? Don't include it. You can lead up to it because that, the leading up to it is very interesting, including when it's sudden and by surprise, when characters don't see it coming. Or, or when they do, but it's entirely unlikely that maybe they don't like each other. And the aftermath is interesting. Absolutely it is. The aftermath is interesting. Even the immediate aftermath, with clothing off the, the curtain rods and, and, and furniture overturned and whatnot, when suddenly the characters look around and realize that things have changed. But why is that moment so interesting when we see it in literature? It's so interesting in literature specifically because the characters are coming back to themselves. In other words, they have been completely gone from themselves. Their bodies have been moving, but their character, the things we've been following in the book, has not been there. It has been absent, and now they are coming back to it. That is the nature of the beast. <laughs> so the moments leading up, fine. The moments after, fine. The repercussions, fine. The daydreaming, fine. The actual thing itself, for three, four, five, six, ten pages? No, <laughs> no, no, no. What good does it do? Other than you, uh, other than a, a, an example of you saying, well, I know it's never worked before, but with me, uh, wait till you see, you ain't seen nothing yet. Oh boy, these next six pages aren't going to be like a root canal with no anesthesia. Instead, this is going to be something you're going to want to tell your mother about. <laughs> no. No, there has been no example of that. There cannot be any example of that in literature, in fiction. There can't be. Because every aspect of fiction stops at the door and starts up again when the door is back open. So why describe it? And I know so many effective novels, adult, perceptive, nuanced novels that are highly sexually charged that skip those scenes and are all the better for it. So, so, so uh... The best way of depicting it is don't. Don't even try. Because if you try, then you present your readers and your critics with two options. Either A, they can say, I really wish you hadn't tried. Or B, they can work themselves into some sort of semblance of praise of what you're doing, even though they know perfectly well how bankrupt and stupid it is. If you want an example of that second one, look no further than the hosannas of praise being showered on cleanness by Garth Greenwell. Specifically being showered on the sex scenes that go on endlessly in that book and that are absolutely soulless. They are, they are, I won't, I won't even insult the, the discipline by saying that they are mere architecture. I don't know what they are, but, but they have been eliciting pains of praise from critics who wouldn't ever praise such a thing if they didn't think they were scoring progressive points. If they came across leaden, horrible, mechanical, grinding scenes like those that go on forever and ever in horrible, run-on prose, if they came across scenes like that in a novel about a young heterosexual couple in Miami, those same critics would instantly say this should have been taken out. <laughs> as, but as I've said on this channel many times, I don't do bandwagon jumping. And the stuff in, I mean, Cleanness is an awful, awful book anyway. It, and, and it almost defeats the purpose of even talking about it to say when you take those scenes out. Because there's nothing in it other than that. that it is just pornography. But there, at least there's an attempt at atmosphere building. An attempt at character building. Completely fails. But at least there's that. But you, you can't tell me that a book, that book and other books like it don't just exist for those scenes. And it's the author just daring the, the goateed, vaping crowd at his Brooklyn release party. He's just daring somebody in that crowd to tell him that this is awful, that this is excruciating. It's, it's a classic case of the emperor has no clothes, only I guess for, for the purposes of this tag, we want the empress to have no clothes too and for them to get it on. <laughs> Ridiculous. Absolutely ridiculous. So that, that is the sex in literature tag. And my my response to, if you were to boil all of these questions into a gumbo, or if you were to put them in, in the uh, the blender that my surly houseboy uses for all of his Soylent Green meals, and blend them all together into a Slurpee of some kind, 
my answer to all of them balled together would be don't. <laughs> Just don't. <laughs> Just don't. And that is not Massachusetts Puritanism. Believe you me, that is not. It is <laughs> it it is a look at reality here. That's all. Just reality here. If you had an, an, a relatively engrossing novel, I hate to use the word relatively engrossing in such close proximity to cleanness, but you know I'm not talking about that book. If you if you would have a relatively engrossing novel about two people who maybe aren't completely young anymore, let's say they're in their mid thirties, and there's tension in the air and there are unresolved issues maybe with a kid or custody or something like that and you get to a scene with, at one of their parents' homes at Montauk and there's a meal and the writer describes the meal and the give and take and the scenery and the, you know, the, uh, the, the psychological warfare that's happening at the dinner table. Fine. Absolutely. If that same writer then in the middle of that scene shifted gears and started describing for three or four whole pages how one character or two characters were chewing their food, how they were releasing their saliva to break it down, how they were swallowing it, you would say take that out. And the reason you would say take it out isn't because maybe the author rhetorical ability fails him. Let's say it's beautifully described. You would say as beautifully described as it is, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't further anything in the book. It's, you're just describing a physical act. It, the characters don't, can't do it with any personality, and it doesn't affect the, the conflicts between them. So take it out. Okay. You would say that. You would. Without any hint of old fogey puritanism. I, I argue that that is the same. That, that is, you're saying the exact same thing. The sooner we demystify this whole subject, the better off everybody will be. And it, it's pretty easy to demystify it if you have ever spent time on a farm. <laughs> so, so I don't think that it should be described. Leave it out. Pick it, take things right to the moment of release, right to the moment of people losing control of themselves and throwing off their clothing and pick things up right afterwards if you want to, but not during. <laughs> not during. There's no point to it. It's boring. Uh, so there you go. There's the sex and literature tag. The last, the last uh, item was to tag people you think can handle it. <laughs> and Brian tagged a whole bunch of people that I want to hear. I want to hear answers to everybody on this subject, but <laughs> it, it's going to be, the answers are going to be a case of special pleading in every case. I have been over this subject many, many times. Keep in mind, I was talking about literature in the 60s <laughs> and the 70s. I, I've been over this subject many, many times, and I am perfectly flexible and open-minded on great many literary subjects, but on this subject, I know that I'm right. I have seen too many examples. I've looked for many, too many exceptions and not found them everywhere. There are no exceptions. <laughs> it is just something, it's something that's completely human for human writers to want to include, but they ought to excise it. They ought to take it out. There are no good examples. So the examples that people come up with are going to be a window into them, but not a window into literature. <laughs> and that's, that's going to be awkward, but fun which I guess neatly describes the subject in question, doesn't it? Oh, God. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to wrap this up, but I'll be back. Thank you, Booktube.